Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 17th annual Fannie Lou Hamer Human and Civil Rights Symposium. Um, very, very proud to say that number it was actually my first semester at Stockton when these um, symposium, when, the, when it got started, it was my very first semester. Um, so I am proud to be a part of it and to now be the coordinator of the Africana Studies program. So I want to um, begin with, of course, our fearless president, Dr. Harvey Kesselman, who I don't know if I mentioned to you, Dr. Spencer, who was Dr. Kesselman was a student at the very first class um, to graduate from Stockton, wow. and he is now the president. So I forgot to tell you that little tidbit. Um, so we want to start out by hearing from Dr. Kesselman, and then we will move on with the rest of the event. Thank you so much, Dr. Allison. In 1965, in one of his last public appearances, Malcolm X proclaimed, that's not a chip on my shoulder, that's your foot on my neck. 55 years later, these prophetic words were personified in the death of Mr. George Floyd. And it was in that moment, that eight minutes and 46 seconds of horror that forced a reckoning between our nation's deeply flawed narrative of a fair and colorblind society with the in-your-face reality of yet another black man murdered by the extended arms of systemic racism and police brutality. But as one publication stated, it was also in that moment, the moment of Mr. Joyce Floyd's death that revolutionized the Black Lives Matter movement, which started seven years earlier as a result of another horrific incident, the killing of a teenager, Trayvon Martin, at the hands of a white man. In 2013, the support of Black Lives Matter was modest, but today this movement has engaged nearly 26 million Americans in anti-racism protests across the country and has opened the mouths of once silent supporters to a mobilized global chorus of outrage and demand for change. It is within this context that I offer the official welcome to Stockton University's 17th annual Fannie Lou Hamer Human and Civil Rights Symposium, where our theme is, it's not a moment, it's a movement. Fannie Lou Hamer hails as one of the nation's most influential activists for voter and civil rights. Her incredible story serves as a model of courage, commitment, and bravery in her struggle to achieve equality. Her relentless pursuit of voter rights paved the way for a new generation of modern day freedom fighters of the Black Lives Matter movement. For 17 years, Stockton University has proudly celebrated the life of Mrs. Hamer, and I take great pride in thanking the organizers or sponsors of today's event. The Africana Studies Program, of course, with Dr. Denitris Allison, Donnie Allison, who's a professor of Af Africana Studies, and a professor of communication st studies and director of strategic initiatives for the university, the Unified Black Students Society, the Council of Black Faculty and Staff, and various other university contributors. At Stockton, we want our students to become actively engaged citizens, involved in the process of bringing about the changes of tomorrow. And rest assured, change is coming. Every day greets our society with grave new challenges. This year, 2020 has ushered in a devastating season of coronavirus, an illness that knows no boundaries, now even touching the highest held office in our nation. An illness which has claimed more than 200,000 American lives, the majority within communities of color, amplifying the existing inequities of our healthcare, employment, and housing systems. Moreover, challenges to our democracy have become prominent and flagrant. Misinformation and disinformation flood our social media channels, polarizing our nation, even on crucial healthcare matters, such as wearing a mask. Even more, sadly, this year we laid to rest three renowned leaders and staunch proponents of civil rights and social justice, all departed this world, leaving behind critical messages to citizens to fight for democracy and we must. So 
to all of the white supremacists out there standing by, seeking to divide and terrorize our nation, I say without any reservations, we, the people of Stockton University, denounce everything you stand for. We denounce white supremacy and we stand together in unity, vigorously promoting diversity and inclusion because as Mahatma Gandhi proclaimed, our ability to reach unity in diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. And together, we, all of us, will not fail. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Kesselman, for those strong words that we needed to hear right now. Um, next, we're going to hear from Amaya Roundtree, the president of the Unified Black Student Society at Stockton. Hello, everybody. As you heard, my name is Amaya Roundtree. I am president of Stockton's um, Unified Black Student Society. Today, we'd like to welcome you to our 17th annual Fannie Lou Hamer Symposium. We choose to honor Fannie Lou Hamer every year in hopes that her story and her journey will motivate you guys in all your future endeavors in life. And we do not want this symposium to just be a movement, um, a moment. We want this symposium to be a movement for you guys. Thank you, Amaya. Um, so now we're going to turn to a video that our phenomenal production services team worked on um, for several weeks. And it just gives some highlights of our 17 year history of doing this symposium. Um, we've had some phenomenal speakers over the years. We've had um, artistic expressions. And so we want to um, share that with you. So let me share right now and make sure that you can all see the screen. And I am going to um, play the video and then we will hear from our phenomenal speaker for today. Welcome, I'm Dr. Pat Reed Merritt. I'm a professor here of Africana Studies and Social Work and Coordinator for the Africana Studies Program. This program is very special to us. As indicated earlier, it's the fifth annual Fannie Lou Hamer program. But this program was made possible by a very special individual. We were not planning on celebrating the legacy of Ms. Hamer. We were not focused on the fact that we're only 12 miles west of Atlantic City. In 1964, a historic event took place there at the Democratic National Convention where Ms. Hamer challenged the authority of the Democrats to not allow certain people to be seated and to have the open opportunity to vote. Mrs. Hamer is famous for saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she made that stance in Atlantic City. And so it became a natural thing for us to be here and celebrate the 40th anniversary of that protest. The person who brought that protest to us, our knowledge of that protest, and said we ought to celebrate was Mr. Giles Wright. Mr. Giles Wright at the time was the director of African American Studies for the New Jersey Historical Commission. We had started to talk in early April about what we would do to celebrate the fifth anniversary of this special event, which has become a tradition here at Stockton. One of the things that you should know if you're a student at Stockton is you're not allowed to leave this place and say, I never heard of Fannie Lou Hamer. Everybody here, everybody who comes through our door should know something about Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer. Historically, the Fannie Lou Hamer Human and Civil Rights Symposium has been held right here in the Stockton Performing Arts Center, or the PAC as we call it. And in this space, we've had some incredible scholars and politicians, authors, and activists who've graced this stage, such as Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, Dr. Malefi Asante, Dr. Cornell West, Donna Brazil, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, Sean King, and many others. They have delivered messages to us about Fannie Lou Hamer's legacy and our continued need to fight for that legacy by exercising our right to vote and by raising our voices in protest over injustice. It has been a profound 17 years. And in addition to great speakers, we've also shown our audience that the arts is a significant part of raising our voices to social injustice through performances by the Stockton Gospel Choir, spoken word artists, dramatic interpretations of Fannie Lou Hamer's experience, and dance performance by Afro One Dance Ensemble. We have shown just that, the way the arts contribute to that expression. It has been a historical and memorable 17 years. 
But this year is different. This year is unprecedented. There will be no one filling these seats. No students, no faculty and staff, no administrators or parents, or even the larger community. No one can physically be here, but we can be here virtually, and we should be here virtually, to continue celebrating Mrs. Hamer and continue offering our community dynamic speakers to inspire and motivate us. This year will be different in its delivery, but no different in its goal. We will celebrate the birthday of Mrs. Hamer, which is today, October 6th, and we will celebrate her legacy in the civil rights struggle. We will also address the moment we currently find ourselves in, in continued racial unrest and injustice. And we acknowledge the undeniable truth that this struggle may present itself in moments of challenges. But we need to understand that it's not a moment, it's a movement. The first time I attended a Fannie Lou Hamer symposium here at Stockton was when I actually first transferred here to Stockton, which was in the fall of 2016. It's been an amazing experience every year. Every time I go back, I'm excited to hear what the keynote speaker has to say, because even though the facts about Fannie Lou Hamer herself don't change, the inspiration and her legacy clearly has left a mark on those who speak about her, which is only more inspiring to me as an Africana Studies major. The first time I learned about Miss Fannie Lou Hamer is through her famous quote, which says, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. As a young activist, I do my own research on civil rights leaders and women rights leaders, so I've learned a lot about her through my own personal research, but it's through that famous quote of hers that we are still feeling today as African Americans and people of color, the same feelings as she was feeling back then when she said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. It was my first initial act interaction with Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer. I think it's incredibly important that Stockton continue to honor her legacy, especially because, you know, a historic moment is right there in Atlantic City uh, when she was there at the 1964 Democratic National Convention where she demanded to have a seat and to have a voice at that table. And I think it would be a great disservice to students attending if we didn't continue this because people from all walks of life, even myself, obviously, I hadn't learned about her before 2016. So I think it's important to show students from all backgrounds that there's this important person in history to look up to and to, especially in the climate we're in now, to still fight for civil rights and voting rights. I think that it's very important that we continue Ms. Hamer's legacy here at Stockton for two main reasons. One, to educate voters and students on the importance of voting in the upcoming election, and two, to get voters out to the polls in this very important election that we are currently experiencing with the political climate. Happy birthday, Fannie Lou Hamer! Thank God for Fannie Lou Hamer! But you know what, thank God for Stockton College and Dr. soon-to-be President Harvey Kesselman and Dr. Patricia Reed uh, Merritt because they represent the excellence that Stockton has always sought to have. And they represent the diversity and excellence at the same time that we know is possible in New Jersey and in this country. I'm really excited about being here today and I understand that Stockton College slash university is one of the only schools in not just the state, but the country that actually pauses to recognize Fannie Lou Hamer on her birthday and the magnificent sacrifices every day ordinary person used by God to do something extraordinary did and brought to our country. I met Fannie Lou Hamer at a mass meeting and from that mass meeting she went to register to vote. I was in the bus that took her to register to vote. Now you got to understand Fannie Lou Hamer was unlike most people. She was a religious fundamentalist, she was a political pragmatist, she was a very gregarious person who loved people but who didn't take anything from anyone. Hamer would have challenged us to do 
When she challenged the Democratic Party in 1964, she simply wanted to have a seat at the table, even if it meant she had to bring in a folding chair. I want to have a seat at the table. I want to have a say in the governor of my country. And she was beaten for that. She was jailed for that. She was marginalized for that. We shouldn't forget that this occurred just a few decades ago. We shouldn't forget that there was a struggle for civil rights in this country, a struggle for voting rights. But see, Fannie Lou Hamer did not care. She did not care. She refused to accept inequality. Now, it might be useful at this moment to step back and talk about the rules. See, Fannie Lou Hamer wanted us to have one set of rules, Justice, but she also exemplifies the kind of person who's going to go get it. We live in a go-along-to-get-along society. We live in a society of half measures. We don't want to call anybody out because it's too delicate to call folks out. Now, I don't know if everybody here loves President Obama, but I'm going to tell you something. I do. And I'm, you know, I'm not dissing anybody who doesn't, but I do. <laughs> this is a phenomenal president, but at the same time, he's not a perfect president. And we have to be clear about that. Nobody is perfect. So here we are, more polarized than ever. And civil rights has become a polarizing issue when it once upon a time it was an American issue, and there was moral authority associated with standing up for civil rights. Fannie Lou Hamer was an American revolutionary. Oh, yes, she was. She kept track of the vicious legacy of white supremacy and connected it with the vicious legacy of imperial arrogance, and also was always willing to be humble and to bear witness, not in the spirit of self-righteousness, but a spirit of resiliency. And when I lay myself down to sleep, I know each and every single day I did my damn best to help our people. And I don't do it for the shine and I don't do it for the vine. I'm certainly not a famous person. I ain't in jet, ebony, or essence. <laughs> but I do it for Fanny. And I do it for Ella. I do it for my mom who still works. I do it for my grandmother, graduated from school at 16. I do it for the women that came before me and the women and men after. So Fannie Lou, in my own memory, has always been so important. She was always the great hero for my mother of the civil rights movement. She always talked about how you hear always about Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks, but it was re really Fannie Lou. You know, Fannie Lou who was on the ground, Fannie Lou who was a sharecropper herself, who was a child laborer picking between 200 and 300 bales of cotton as a child, and Fannie Lou who was beaten so badly by the police that she suffered permanent injuries. I think that um, I'm honored to be giving this talk and remember, remembering Fannie Lou Hamer and to really think about her in a moment that I'll be talking about today of Black Lives Matter, of Ferguson, of Baltimore, and of Charlotte and to think back to that civil rights generation as really having experienced and mobilized in exactly the ways that we see young people today. So I want to hold up some of those people and talk about what that tradition represented. But I also want to talk about what Dr. King referred to as the fierce urgency of now. That is, how does the legacy of the civil rights movement, especially the radical voices of the civil rights movement, relate to the political moment that we find ourselves in today. I would respond to the question that the civil rights leaders uh, today and for the future are those of you that I am in fact looking at. I take, for instance, in my new role as the Director of Faith and Constituency Outreach for the Democratic National Committee, two years ago, young people around this country registered to vote and voted for the first African-American president of the United States of America. What more fulfilling tribute to Fannie Lou Hamer but that young people, disproportionate, did in fact what she lost her life for, what she got laughed at about, what she got talked about, all because she wanted the opportunity to control her political destiny. I, I want to 
say that the leadership taken by the Africana Studies Program uh, in this regard is perhaps the vanguard position of any uh, Africana Studies Program in the nation on Fannie Lou Hamer. I don't know any other program that has uh, uh, joined this effort uh, any more intensely than you have at Stockton. People who worked in organizations, whether it was the Panther Party, uh, SNCC, whether it was any of the organizations, RAM, whether it was the Nation of Islam, those people felt that this was a way to change the objective conditions in America. People put their lives on the line because they felt that America could actually change, that their children could actually have a different place in this world. That's why people put themselves on the line. It wasn't like they made a decision, I'm going to do this. People were compelled, and one of the compulsions, one of the compulsions was that, for me, one of the compulsions was that I actually could do something to change 400 years of history, 400 years of history. So I tell people that, and I always ask them the same thing I will ask you, what would you do? What would you do if you thought you could turn this whole thing around? We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. All right. Yeah. I woke up this morning with my mind. All my life I've been sick and tired. Now I'm sick and tired 
of being sick and tired. I don't think there's even a white person under the sun could say they would be patient as long as we've been patient. This is just a lot of crap that folks talk about true democracy of this country, because ain't nobody had it. You hadn't had it because you can't have yours until I have mine. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. For so many years, Negroes have suffered in the state of Mississippi. And we are tired of people saying that we are satisfied because we are everything but satisfied. This country is sick. And the only way this country will survive is people working like you and like I'm working. It's really concerned about human beings of this country. Because other than that, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And the same thing go with a nation. A nation divided against itself cannot stand. And it's going to take people like you that's concerned about this country that can make a great society. The salvation of this country will rest on your shoulder, all of your shoulders. This young and determined to see that things will change not only in Mississippi, but all around this country for human beings. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. I hope you all enjoyed that um, rendition. Special shout out to Amanda Martinez who did the editing for that video. She did a phenomenal job and thank you to all the folks over in production services. Um, next is our main event. Um, I should say. We're going to hear from Dr. Zoe Spencer, who is a professor of sociology and social work and criminal justice at Virginia State University. Um, she is also an Emmy Award winning writer um, for her piece, her spoken word piece, Say Her Name. And she has numerous uh, scholarly publications. Uh, her work was also featured in Ava DuVernay's documentary, The 13th. Um, she's a regular presenter and educator um, at some of the correctional facilities in Virginia. And um, my favorite part is that she's a fellow Howard sister, Howard University um, alumni, and I'm just so incredibly proud to have her here. The um, students of UBSS um, voted for her to be our speaker, and I was super excited to hear that because she is a writer and a scholar and an activist and just a phenomenal woman. Uh, as Maya Angelou would say. So without further ado, I will bring to you Dr. Zoe Spencer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, um, I'm going to really be real and I'm inviting everyone. It's, it's really difficult for me not to be in everyone's physical presence, but I'm inviting everyone into, um, into this space, into this collective space that we're going to share and in looking at the video, I realized that I'm going to do something a little bit differently. Um, but before I begin, I really, really want to thank Dr. Allison and the Africana Studies Program. And I want to thank Amaya and UBSS, all of you, for um, seeing something in me that I really don't know. I'm really humbled um, to have been selected by you all. And I wanted to give you all something special because in my space, I don't believe that anything happens um, by chance. And so I'm going to first invoke the presence of um, my ancestors, the presence of our ancestors that um, guide this space and ask them to really guide my lips and guide my purpose and guide my tongue. I wanna thank President Kesselman as well. Um, it's not too often, and I'm at an HBCU, but it's not too often that I hear a university president to just come out and speak 
so fervently and so staunchly against white supremacy um, and racism and all forms of oppression. Um, so I want to thank you as well, uh, President Kesselman. Um, in our space, the first thing that we usually do in honor of our ancestors is we pour libation for our ancestors. And if I were there, I would probably simulate um, pouring libation. And so first I want to say happy Be Earth Day to Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm honored to be here in this space on this day. And I believe that her spirit is, is in this space. Her spirit has definitely guided Stockton University in its work and activism. So I pour libation to her and I say happy birthday. Um, and thanks for your continued guidance. Um, I, I wanted to start out um, because when I was thinking about what I wanted to say, and oftentimes when, when I come to a space, I, I ask for guidance and I kind of pray and meditate on um, what I'm supposed to say. Um, and in, initially I was going to do a, a more kind of formal um, presentation. I wasn't sure um, what motivated the invitation, but I'm sure that the Say Her Name piece was one of the motivations. And so if you all could kind of join with me um, as I pay homage to Sandra Bland, Say Her Name, and Corinne Gaines, Say Her Name, and also Brianna Taylor, Say Her Name, which are at the forefront of, of my spirit right now. Um, so I was thinking about what I wanted to, to bring today and the ancestors said that I wasn't supposed to do anything academic and that I would reserve those, um, perhaps those questions that you all may have for the Q&A section. But the ancestors told me that there was someone or some people that would be present that I needed to speak to. And oftentimes, I think that when we as academicians, and I know that Dr. Allison introduced me as Dr. Zoe Spencer and the Emmy and all of, and the activism, sometimes when we're invited to spaces, I think that that professionalism and all of the social constructs that we use to define ourselves become predominant in our interaction um, with the audience. But we're in this really, really critical moment right now. And the one thing that I do know is that each of you is leading the way. So I am an activist, but I'm 53 years old. And right before George Floyd was murdered, I was in a car accident and I fractured my knee. And so I was sidelined. I'm usually an organizer and I was sidelined. And I believe that the most high, the ancestors, did that for a purpose because it allowed me to sit back and it allowed me to see the way that your generation is moving and mobilizing um, and, and the power that you all contribute to this movement moment. And that's what we call it, this movement moment. And so a lot of the reforms that are taking place right now, a lot of the political and social attention, cultural attention to the issues of white supremacy, racism, um, homophobism, uh, all of the isms that plague the world right now are at the forefront of these discussions. And they're only at the forefront of these discussions because your generation has been pivotal in creating the tension that is always, always necessary to invoke social change. I want to be very clear that no social change, no political change has ever happened without mass resistance. No social or political change has ever happened without mass resistance. And so if I were before you, and if you all can join me because I believe I can feel your energy, I want you all to give yourselves a big round of applause, clap in your own homes, clap where you are for the work that you all are doing and that you all have done to begin to stimulate this change. And as we move into this election, the legacy and the spirit of Fannie Lou Hamer is upon us. The legacy and the spirit of Fannie Lou Hamer is upon us to be responsible, 
to make sure that we're researching, to make sure that we're, we're being active, to make sure that we're, we're mobilizing, not just around the, the issues and the discussions, but around the real work that has to be done in order to continue to advance social and political change. The topic, this is not a moment, is a movement, was really, really significant for me. And so I wanted to start out my discussion um, by reading a piece from one of my favorite artists, um, Kendrick Lamar. And bear with me for a minute because I know you don't know me, but today I want to be more vulnerable and I wanna use my life and my work as, 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 a, as an example, the things that you don't see, as an example to those people who are engaged in the struggle and those people who are engaged in struggle. And so I wanted to start by reading this really, really quickly. Um, it's from um, Kendrick Lamar's um, song. It's, it's called Mama. And, and the lyrics go, I know everything. I know everything, know myself. I know moral morality, spirituality, good and bad health. I know fatality might haunt you. I know everything. I know Compton. I know street shit. I know shit that's conscious. I know everything. I know lawyers, advertisements, their sponsors. I know wisdom. I know bad religion. I know good karma. I know everything. I know history. I know the universe works mentally. I know the perks of bullshit isn't meant for me. I know everything. I know cars, clothes, holes, and money. I know loyalty. I know respect. I know those that's honorary. I know everything. The highs, the lows, the groupies, the junkies. I know if I'm generous at heart, I don't need recognition. The way I'm rewarded, well, that's God's decision. I know you know the lines from Compton School District. Just give it to the kids. Don't gossip about how it's distributed. I know how people work. I know the price of life. I know how much it's worth. I know what I know and I know it well not to ever forget until I realized I didn't know shit the day I came home. We've been waiting for you, waiting for you, waiting for you, waiting for you. I wanted to start with that because I wanted to, to take a moment to say that the spirit of the ancestors lives in all of us. Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, Marcus Garvey, Che Guevara, all of the legendary, all of the legends, all of the revolutionaries, all of the activists that go before us. But the things that we don't see when they reach the media and when they reach the textbooks, the history books, are the struggles, those moments that exist that build them. Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And for us, we think about the ways in which the history, the legacy of racial oppression, the ways in which that legacy has affected each and every one of us, generations of us, be it the institution of enslavement, to Jim Crow, to lynching, to the civil rights struggle and the civil rights violation, to the resistance to the Civil Rights Act, to police brutality and state-sponsored violence. There have been people who have been fighting those instances for centuries. However, what people don't understand is that each of the people who proclaim to be activists have gone through their own struggles. And when we talk about the difference between a moment and a movement, we have to look at the moments that we all experience that create the movement in us. Each and every one of you are a part of this movement. Each and every one of you are being prepared for this movement. So I wanted to speak to those people um, like myself, and I'm going to be vulnerable for a second, but I have, to be, um, I have to be honest and I have to be obedient to the ancestor's guidance. There is somebody in the audience or somebody's in the audience who have gone through struggles, be it struggle in, in the family, struggle in the community, the disappointments that we all go through, the ways in which things didn't go right. There's somebody in the audience who has contemplated just giving up. 
be it giving up in school, being given, be it giving up in, in relationships, um, be it giving up on the family, be it giving up on self. But what I want to say to you is that every situation, every struggle that we go through prepares us. For those who don't go through struggle, we don't understand and we're not able to see how resilient we can be. Before Fannie Lou Hamer was Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer experienced the struggles, experienced the, the traumas of being Black and of being a woman in a racist and patriarchal society. We, have, we all go through things. I want to speak about myself for a second because people will see the work that's being done, but they don't see the struggle that goes behind that. Regardless of the introduction, the doctors, the letters and dots behind my name, I am Zoe Spencer. I am from Berry Farms Projects in Washington, D.C. I was not born middle class. I was born struggling working class with a struggling working class mother. Well, why do you say that, Z? I say that because that struggle that I experienced growing up in Berry Farms was a preparation for me. It was preparation. It was the moment that allowed me to manifest in this movement. I was the victim of trauma growing up. Well, why do you talk about you were the victim of trauma going up? What does that have to do with this moment? What does that, this have to do with Fannie Lou Hamer? It has to do with Fannie Lou Hamer because we all go through traumas and the traumas that I experienced in my walk prepared me for this moment. The things that I went through allowed me to understand that every time I was able to overcome an obstacle, it showed me resilience. Every time I was able to overcome a disappointment, it showed me that all wounds heal with time. And so for each and every one of those moments, I was able to elevate and elevate and elevate to this point in time. I wrote something for you guys that I wanted to read to you that was given to me. The moment is born from each and every one of us. From the moments that encompass our struggles, traumas, lessons, hits, what we perceive to be our failures, that we rise from, like Phoenix from the ashes, getting it from the mud. This movement is a compilation of moments that drive those of us who are willing to be humble enough to know that we are just the microcosm of the universe and humble and real enough to know that despite all we know, all the ways that men create to give us intellectual or academic value in the grand scheme of the multiversal realm of knowledge, we don't know shit. So we're prepared to be humble enough and willing to sit quietly and listen to the lessons our foremothers and fathers pass on in the wind or in our dreams or when there is a brilliant moon and we wake up at 3.30 and can't sleep hearing ourselves speak loudly yet silently to our inner selves. Listen to the lessons that strangers and vagabonds, those whom we're trained to disregard, not respect, are sent to give. And then have faith enough to sacrifice, struggle, be selfless. Recognize our resilience. Get the fuck up after we fall and are knocked or kicked down by the ills we face. Realize that each trauma makes us stronger and prepares us for the moment when movement is born allows us to understand that movement is not easy. It is not self-aggrandizing, deeper than a seat on MSNBC or CNN or a professional panel or an Emmy Award for a piece that should never have had to be written. Realize the movement is only born through us, those who engage unapologetically, knowing we will face ostracism, criticism, not be favored or popular, to take those losses, take those hits that seem unrecoverable, but faith in what is higher than us will show us that when we fight for a righteous cause, that is liberation from bondage, freedom to move, the ability to know and regard ourselves outside of any oppressor's interpretation, equality and equity, we will always be protected and provided for. They want us to say that we are not our ancestors. Well, I am my ancestors. I refuse to forget that without them, none of us would ever be. 
we are built on the legacies that they create. We build upon the legacies that they create. The movement is born from each and every one of you, from the moments, from the moments, from the moments that encompass our struggles, traumas, lessons, hits, what we perceive to be our failures, disappointments, losses. So when you're faced with that trying moment, remember me, not remember me because of an Emmy or remember me or remember the ancestors because of what we saw. Remember all and let the walk be a reminder that all wounds heal with time. The struggle is meaningful. It is preparation for your purpose. Remember you are resilient, just like your ancestors. Let the ancestors move through you. And when you are ready, the legacy of movements past that these movements are built upon are waiting for you. You are the, mo the movement. From your moments, you become the movement. As long as we must say their names, there's still work to be done. The same work our ancestors did. And to the question, who is ready to do the work in their own divine way? Who is willing to lead the movement in their own divine way? Raise your hand, raise your hand, and raise your ever-present spirit, and then say your name. I am, say your name. No, no, no. I am, I need you to say your name for me. You are, and because you are, we will all be. So I wanted to leave you with that. I'm not sure if, if that's my time, but I wanted to leave you with that simply because oftentimes we don't recognize that we are the movement. You are the movement. I watched you all build this contemporary movement. And no matter what you're going through, I just want to give to you, and maybe it's not in line with what others spoke about, and I'm hoping that I reach that one person that I was sent to reach. I want you to know that no matter what you go through, no matter what disappointments you experience, each of you are prepared in your moments to become critical pieces of the movement. So I will um, stop there. I'm not sure if, if that was my time. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring on now um, Dr. Christina Harris, who is Assistant Professor of Africana Studies, and she's going to take the questions and feed them to you. So I hope those of you out there listening were as moved as I was just now and will contribute your questions or comments um, on the Q&A and uh, Dr. Harris will start um, with her if she has any reflection or question. We can start with Dr. Harris and take it from there. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Dr. Zoe. That was very timely. I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. I'm teaching a course this semester on Black Lives Matter and just so many of the things that you said resonated. Um, and it, it's a, a topic that we can and should study in an academic sense, but it's so much more than that. And I think that you really captured that um, here for us today and really made it personal for each of us. So thank you so much for that. Um, the first question that I want to ask you, you, you made it a, a very important quote in saying that no social or political change has ever happened without mass resistance. Um, I know this to be true. You know, we talk about this a lot. Uh, in you know academia and activism. So with the point that we are right now in the United States, we've seen so much mass resistance happening recently. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has really risen to a crescendo and gone to places that uh, I don't think any of us ever imagined that it would. So what's the next step for us as a society? Um, how do we continue this momentum um, and keep moving forward so that the movement continues and doesn't just stop in this moment? So I think, I think understanding, first, I want to go back because understanding history is important because when we talk about 
movements past, um, especially when we talk about it um, in the mainstream and, and in mainstream literature, oftentimes we focus on the, the peaceful resistance that took place. There's this t-shirt that says, I am not my ancestors. And so oftentimes we talk about the, the peaceful resistance movements. Um, the reason why I say that there has never been any kind of significant political um, social or economic change without mass resistance is because we have to understand that the more aggressive movements are always flanking the peaceful movements. And so I know that, you know, a lot of scholars, um, you know, um, a lot of scholars have debated, um, you know, the way that the movement happened and some of the, the um, more aggressive forms of resistance that occurred um, in this latest um, this latest crescendo of a movement. And a lot of people had a lot of criticism about the, the, the aggression. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't, I can't find an, another word, but about the quote unquote aggression that people mm -hmm. use, but that is necessary. Where do we go from here? We have to keep the pressure going. We can't, we can't, we can't leave it. And we have to understand that movement is, is multifaceted. A lot of people see the movement that is presented on TV, the action, we call it the direct action that we see on TV. But the direct action is the, is the compelling force to other um, policy changes, um, policy transformations, legal transformations, other transformations that are happening. And so I think that it's really important moving forward to make sure that we stay connected, that we don't create divides within the movement and amongst the movement makers, that we respect everybody's perspective, the way that each area works together to promote the total transformation. And I think oftentimes those undercurrent components, and this is for you know people who are in the audience, some people may not have gone outside in the street, right? You know, I couldn't go outside. I broke my leg. I was mad. I could not go outside and protest. I would have been in the street had it not been for my leg. But what I learned from that is that there are other movements that are flanking that pressure movement. And we have to be able to make sure that all of those movements are unified and that we don't allow the system of our oppression to define what movement is supposed to look like and to, to um, denigrate the, the movements that are operating kind of under the current. Um, so I say moving forward, I just think that we need to, I'm gonna say they, because they were leading. You all need to continue that fuel um, and also be strategic about those policy and those legal reforms that also need to happen, those social and political transformations that also need to happen um, while the other movement is percolated. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and that's a great segue into the next question. Um, I have a student here. And the question is, Auntie Z, how oh, would man. you help students, I love it, identify their place in the movement? You, listen, okay, I'm going to give you two answers. Since you call me Auntie Z, I'm going to give you the Auntie Z answer. Everybody has a divine purpose, Darius. Everybody has a divine purpose. And it isn't it isn't for anyone else to dictate to you how you move. What you have to do, one, is you have to study. You have Dr. Harris. You have to study. You have to understand the root of oppression so that as you engage movement, you're engaging movement from the perspective of, of uprooting the root. When we talk about white supremacy, unless we understand the root of white supremacy, we were not going to be able to undo white supremacy. Mm -hmm. We talk about patriarchy um, and capitalism mm. as, as, some co as sub components and interacting components of, of white supremacy. If we don't understand how those things root our systems of oppression, then when we fight and when we strategize, we're only plucking leaves and we're only plucking the stems of oppression. And of course, we all know that if we do not capture the root of it, to grow again. So um, Eric, I would say, I think one, I would say that's first, to study the history of oppression because nothing has changed. We just did a degree right now. We're at a 360 degree, and I think people of color really need to be 
conscious about what is happening. And so first study, and then you have to decide what you're good at and the way that the ancestors call on Fannie Lou Hamer, call on Ida B. Wells, call on those gone before and let them guide the way that you are supposed to participate in the movement. And then Darius, when you do it, don't let anybody make you second guess yourself. And understand that when you engage, it's going to be uncomfortable. You will be ostracized. It's not going to be easy. Don't let, you know, the, the ways that those of us who come and speak to you, don't let the outside or the external appearance make you believe that activism doesn't come without struggle because true activism is very, very, very uncomfortable and very, very, very self-sacrificing. So I'm going to um, call the ancestors and hope that they guide you and know that I'm supporting you along your way. All right. I have a couple more questions that I'm going to try to get in here really quickly. Um, so Danielle wants to know, what advice can you give to young leaders and activists that will encourage them to continue this movement? I know a lot of us, including myself, get a little discouraged when justice isn't served or when we hear of another victim of police brutality. I know this with Breonna Taylor's situation right now. So Danielle says, what else can we do to push for change beyond marching and protesting? How do we stay encouraged? Danielle, that's a good question. I'm 53 and I've been doing work since my days at Howard University. Um, the first thing is that we have to be realistic about the fact that transformation, true social and political transformation, which is what's required. Like when you think about when you think about the oppressions that we are um, we are 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 dealing with today, they've been with us for 401 years. They've been with us. So we're, we're talking about having to dismantle the fiber of a structure and a system that is built upon oppression. So what I will say to you as, as, as an auntie, I want you to stay fervent and know that you may not see a, a, a dramatic transformation right now, but you have to stay the course and understand that every little gain, every gain is a gain and let those little gains be your motivation to continue on. Um, you know, I, I, with the piece say her name, I, I don't celebrate it because it should never have had to be written. And even though we, God forbid, I hope we don't, but if we have to say another name, we have to let each name be a greater fire, a hotter fire that encourages us to keep moving. And in the interim between names, in order to prevent another name, we have to make that be the fire. So Danielle, make that be the fire, be the fire, let that be the fire, never wanting to have to say another name, let that be the fire that continues the motivation. Um, as far as change beyond marching and protesting, you know, I am not a big fan because I consider myself in this stuff that I haven't said about my work. There are things that you all don't know about my work, but I consider myself a revolutionary. And originally, you know, I'm not a big fan of voting, um, but right now I would say that you that vote, um, but be conscious about what that looks like, understand that structure, um, begin to visit, like really study those, like I said before, those roots of oppression, so that in the meantime, before we have to go back outside and march and protest, we can start to unroot the ways that oppression is solidified through our social, political, and economic system. And it just requires, mm -hmm. it requires study. It requires study. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, so I have uh, two people that are asking for advice. So I'm going to try to combine these and give them both to you. Um, one person says that they have a lot of white friends and associates that want to be involved but don't know how. Um, so advice for that. And then secondly, 
um, a student who wants to become a police officer. Um, they say that I feel that we need to be more open-minded in the field of criminal justice and bring the equality that we are supposed to stand for. I love bringing justice to everyone and I am in full support of the message in the Black Lives Matter movement upholds. Any advice for I or other people who want to be police officers? So the first question, Dr. Harris, um, what was, um, let me see. I I'm sorry. So maybe let's just go one so at a time. The, the so that was about... I Any see. advice for white uh, friends and associates that want to be involved but don't know how? I have two. I have one. Let me twist that for a second. For black melanated people, you have to know who you are. And, and this, this is real. This is if I don't give you anything else. You have to first know who you are. Because if you don't understand who you are as a black person, when you go to white people, you're going to white people as a favor. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I need y'all to feel that. You have to understand your legacy, what your melanin means, what your pineal gland means. You have to understand the legacy that you come from. You have to understand your pre-enslavement, your pre-enslavement contribution to world civilization. That's one. Because if you don't know who you are, you're going to be dependent on your oppressors to define who you are. For white people who are your allies and who want to do the work, I also recommend that they also study who you are. You know, it's actualization is, is, is two part. White people engage privilege and privilege is convenient because white people also don't know who black people are. So for those who want to be a part of the movement, study as well, study as well. And then two, understand that giving up your privilege shouldn't be a privilege for you to do. And when you engage the movement, you can't engage the movement from a perspective of privilege. And that goes to everybody. It has to be engaged from the perspective of respect. And then sometimes it's necessary to be quiet and to listen and to allow the people who are enduring the struggle to articulate what that looks like and to also give guidance on how you can help. Oftentimes people, including academicians, like we walk into spaces and we think that because we have a PhD in sociology that you know we um, have this control over the movement and that we can speak for the people. I never ever, and this is for anybody who is an activist, never ever go into a space believing that you understand the struggle. When you're engaging in activism, it is not your role to snatch the mic from the people who are on the ground. And I don't mean the people who are on the ground ground, the people who are actually experiencing harshly the trauma and the struggle. Go in and listen and then be a voice for the people. That's the selflessness that it takes. So not just for white allies, but for all activists, always, always be the voice of the people that you are claiming to represent. Um, and then and they to, the, connect that to the police officer yeah. question also. I think that's, yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'm actually, um, Allison, I am actually doing work with the police chiefs in our area while I'm waiting for this revolutionary change to happen. Um, I think that if you're going to become a police officer, one, you do have to understand that the history of policing is well grounded in lynching tradition and anti-blackness um, from the slave patrol to the lynch mob to the police force. And so when you enter, you do have to understand that that is a culture that has a centuries long grounding in um, racial oppression. And so if you want to, if that is what you're going to do in order to bring justice, you have to be the police officer that is willing to be uncomfortable, that's willing to challenge the status quo, that's willing to uplift and create a transformative culture by your being, that's willing to be the voice when you might just be by yourself. Um, I think that that's very, very important. So. Um, I, I want you to be a police officer because it takes more police officers who are conscious and culturally actualized to be able to change the culture in policing. Um, otherwise, you become complicit in the oppression. 
Thank you so much. So we're a little over time. I'm going to wrap up, but I, I do want to bring one last question that I think is very, very important to sort of close us out and bring us full circle here. Um, you talked a lot about struggle and its importance um, and how it is ne a necessary part of that forward um, motion and, and, you know, propelling us into the next level. Um, and in thinking about that, you know, we think that we as an African people are always about balance, right? And so Darius has a great question here. How do we balance participation in the movement with joy, rest, and self-care? Um, so I think that's a great, you know, question to leave out on. Darius, you hit home. Um, you hit home because I don't, I don't, I've, I've yet to master that. Um, and I think that it's very, very important. Um, I really, I, I haven't mastered that. And, and a lot of the people who are around me in my space, they get worried about me because it's 24 seven. Um, and it is very hard. And there's some times when I sit in the shower and I cry and, you know, I, I let it out and I get tired. I mean, when, when our ancestor, Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like that, I believe is a common place. Um, and so it, it, it is hard. Um, but the actualization piece, I think, in the midst of struggle is to be able to go outside and look around and see the beauty um, that is around us, the beauty that is going to sound so Erica Baduish, but the beauty that is the earth and how beautiful the earth is outside of the trauma and the turmoil that men create in it. Um, to be able to take those inhales, exhales, to be able to be with your loved ones and to spend time with your loved ones doing things and talking about things other than struggle, but allowing that to be your gas so that you're pumping it into yourself and that you're able to go back out and, and move. But a staunch mm -hmm. activist life is is 24 seven um, and it's, it's really difficult. So that's a difficult question to answer um, because I haven't mastered it yet. <laughs> I do know that it's you know so important to just schedule time intentionally to love ourselves um, and to take care of ourselves. And so, you know, I support you as you continue working towards that because we need you to continue to be in a part of this movement for a long, long time. Again, thank you so much for your thank work. You. Thank and thank you. you for answering our questions and your interactions with us. This was such a, a personable uh, conversation, even though we're all in so many different places and spaces and it's hard to get that connection. Um, but I feel that you did a, a really great job at pulling us all together today. So I, I appreciate you. Thank you. I hope so. Um, I know it was different, but I hope so. And I do want to invite your students to come and sit in my classes anytime. So um, Dr. Allison, Dr. Harris, maybe we can make that happen soon. But thank you all so much. I'm so very humbled. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Zoe, and you know, there's nothing wrong with invoking a Baduism to end <laughs> to end our session with. I also just quickly want to say thank you to um, UBSS and, and the eBoard for helping to make this happen. Um, thank you to Dean Lisa Honecker of the School of Arts and Humanities. Um, thank you to President Kesselman and our interim provost, um, Michelle McDonald. And to our two students who were in the video, Morgan Rush, who is an Africana Studies major, and Danielle Combs, who is the president of the NAACP chapter here. Um, I want to thank Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt, who started the Fannie Lou Hamer Symposium here at Stockton. Um, thank you to Pete Gallagher and the IT department for making this happen. Um, and like I said before, the production services for the video, um, to graphics department, to media relations staff, everyone who contributed to and continued to con contribute every year um, to make this happen. So. Dr. Zell was it was phenomenal. Our record stands. Um, another phenomenal year for the uh, program. Thank, Thank you. you.